Greetings, I'm Keith Klein, the host of the VentureFist podcast, where I interview the most fascinating people in the tech scene. This is episode 333, and today's guest is Jerry Karolova, managing partner at Laconia. From what I've seen, it is very rare for someone to start their career in venture capital and continue to progress up the ranks to a partner position. Usually, an associate or senior associate will do a rotation for like two to three years and then move on to a portfolio company, maybe start their own company or do something else. For Jerry, outside of a stop at Techstars, the path to venture capital started when she was at NYU as an intern for VC firms, including Laconia. Fast forward to today, she is a managing partner at the firm and has been recognized by Forbes as a 30 under 30 recipient. Laconia leads investments in pre-seed and seed stage B2B software companies with a focus around supporting founders in the early days in terms of sales acceleration, operational execution, and capital strategy. In this episode of our podcast, we cover lots of great topics like advice on building a career in venture capital why Jerry chose NYU, and the details of her experience while in college as an operator, a masterclass on how to build your network, and lots of really useful tips on how to avoid the uneasy feeling that some people might have with networking at events, how Laconia got started by David Arcara and Jeffrey Silverman, plus all the details on the firm, seed round funding benchmarks in the current market, the unique due diligence process that Laconia runs, which helps founders make potential customer introductions, details on Laconia's internship and fellowship programs, and so much more. Okay, quick side note, is your company hiring? If the answer is yes, then what are you doing to build up your company's employment brand? If you don't have a content strategy, then it is highly likely that you are just flying under the radar. The good news is that VentureFizz can help. A subscription to VentureFizz includes a content playbook for sharing all the details on your company, people, and culture. We leverage all formats of storytelling to include video, podcasting, employee profiles, and more. Reach out to info at VentureFizz to get more of the details. All right, without further ado, here's my interview with Jerry. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Likewise, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, your journey as a venture capitalist. So uh, I guess I'm kind of going a little bit backwards in terms of my typical format, because we're going to talk a little bit about your... Well, I'm going to switch the the script a little bit because uh, we're going to talk about your career, so that will follow my format. But uh, I think more of an evergreen look of the journey into venture capital is where I wanted to start. So uh, as we're going to discuss, you know, you have navigated your way through the venture capital uh, ranks, whereas I think a lot of other people, maybe it's a two-year or three-year, you know, as an associate, and then they go off into industry, or maybe they found a company, but that hasn't been the case with you. So uh, without talking in detail about your background, can you can you give some advice on you know how w- one should navigate a career in the world of venture capital? Yeah, happy to. So uh, I guess I'll start out by saying that there was no master plan here, which might be a bit of a surprise because if you look at my trajectory on paper, it looks very sort of uh, sequential, right? In a very logical way. It's like intern, associate, principal, partner, um, one VC firm, another VC firm. Um, But actually it wasn't that definitive at the outset. And I know a lot of people now um, are heading into the space and there's almost this urgency to break into VC at any cost. Like that's like the end goal. And for me, you know, early on in my career, I was much more focused on sort of the core principles and qualities that I wanted in a role. And so I knew I wanted to be working on a relatively small team. I didn't want to be at a, you know, 300,000 person organization. I just realized that I thrive much better in a more tight-knit environment. I wanted to be in a place where I was constantly learning and where there was growth potential and where there would be recognition for a faster learning trajectory, a faster growth trajectory, et cetera. I wanted to work with people I really respected um, and who I had values alignment with. Um, And I also wanted to be in a place where I was uh, constantly expanding the universe and network of people who I was working with. So team that I really respect, small team, learning potential, and then like network expansion opportunities. So I was really looking at venture funds. I was looking at accelerators. I was looking at startups. um, And I was open to pretty much all of these outcomes. And then it ended up being sort of a perfect um, the confluence of factors that Laconia ended up being a place where I can really stay long term. So, so I guess for anyone who's specifically focused on a career in venture capital, I would, you know, I would first want to really understand why do you want to do this? Like, what is your understanding of what a career in venture capital means? And is that aligned with what you actually are qualitatively optimizing for? I want to interrupt real quick, because what yeah, do you think the perception it. is? Like, 
oh, I need, you know, this desire, I need to be in venture capital. Like, what do you think the perception is versus reality of what they should be thinking about as it relates to their career? So what I hear a lot of is I want to be in the weeds, working with founders and like building really cool stuff and being at the cutting edge of technology. That's one thing. The other thing that we hear a lot is like, oh, I really just want better work-life balance than banking, private equity, uh, consulting, uh, whatever uh, pressure cooker you're in right now. Yeah. Um, there's definitely the perception that you can make a lot of money and that it is a lucrative job. And I guess it depends what you're comparing it to. In some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. It, in pretty much all the ways though, it is very, very time delayed. <laughs> in terms of the like significant financial returns um yeah and i think people tend to put it much more in the startup operating bucket particularly at early stage than it actually is if that makes sense like people like because vc spend so much time branding around like we're not really finance people right and we are hands-on in the weeds with founders but that's not actually true <laughs> It is to some degree you have your board work, you're on call, like you're always available to founders when they need you to be. All of that is the case. But if you what you really want is to be in the weeds building product, like you should go do that because this is not that. Yeah, no, I think that's that's great advice. Get some operating experience. Uh, that would definitely be a good good foundation before uh, launching your career in the venture capital. All right, well, let's uh, rewind the clock. So where'd you grow up? What were you like as a child? I grew up in New York, in the North Bronx. I was actually born in Bulgaria. My parents dragged me over when I was two. So I lived in New York pretty much my entire life. Um, <laughs> what was I like as a child? Um, I was, this will surprise no one who actually knows me in person. I was a giant nerd, super studious, voracious reader, um, it was sort of a typical like education heavy immigrant family. Um, you know, because I was commuting into school, I went to school on the Upper East Side from like seventh to twelfth grade. So, like the New York City subway system was basically my backyard, which is either fascinating or depressing, depending on how you feel about the MTA. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, in combination with like kind of always being the the youngest in like my social environment, I think made me a little bit more of an old soul. So I have a sister who's five years older than me. And so I definitely always had this like eagerness to grow up and to join her friend group and to, you know, like hang out with her and be just like her. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of my childhood was characterized by like pushing myself and stretching beyond like what might be expected of like my age group. Um, so, it, you know, I think sometimes I think about like the things around my background and my general like personality that like lend themselves or don't lend themselves to a career in VC. The things that I think are sort of like terrible in my constitution for venture or that I really like having a right answer. Like I really like for things to be logical and correct. And VC is just the world of operating in ambiguity. So that's like a terrible fit. Um, but on the flip side, you know, there are a couple of things that, that actually are pretty aligned, which is, you know, I, I'm really good at learning and teaching myself things. And a lot of venture is just that, right? It's absorbing a lot of information and trying to figure out what's going on in it. Um, I'm also pretty good at thriving in the absence of positive feedback. Um, and in venture, when your feedback loops are so long, like you don't know if you did the right thing for maybe six or seven years, that patience is really important. Um, and then I also just am used to kind of like stretching my capabilities. Like if this is where the bar is, I'm like, all right, I can push myself a little bit harder. Um, so I think a lot of that, yeah, a lot of it probably does come from, from that kind of um, bizarre, somewhat, somewhat like, precocious in terms of actual settings um, type of childhood. All right. So what led you to NYU Stern and and what did you study there? I knew I wanted to stay in a big city. So I pretty much only applied to like cities or, or to schools in cities. So New York, Boston, Philly, um, that was kind of the universe. And I also knew that I wanted to get into business. I don't think I really knew what I meant by that, but that was sort of directionally what I wanted to do. And I ended up at Stern and much to my surprise, people don't go to Stern to learn how to run a business. They go to Stern to learn how to be an investment banker or a consultant, which is all well and fine, but it's just not what I thought I had signed up for. So I spent a fair amount of time kind of floundering and figuring out like, where are all of the business people <laughs> and all of the entrepreneurs? 
Um, and I think I was actually there before I started NYU before they had opened the Leslie E Lab and the Entrepreneurial Institute, which are now just such a center of gravity for all that entrepreneurial activity on campus. Um, and I ended up, you know, finding a couple of interesting pockets there. One was the undergrad Stern Women in Business Club, uh, where I made a couple of my really good friends in college. Um, and then I actually, you know, once I started uh, studying abroad, because I spent two semesters abroad, that's when I actually got into the venture side of things. Um, so it was it was an interesting experience um, because so much of the the university is just sort of like structured around these recruiting funnels into these like big finance industries, particularly given that it's you know in downtown New York. Um, but it was also a great opportunity to just uh, you know discover what I wanted to do instead. And it seemed like you always had a, like an entrepreneurial interest, right? I did. Yeah, I did. I, you know, I also was just kind of working straight through college. Um, and so I had started working at um, a small tutoring and test prep company that was based in uh, Forest Hills. It was based in Queens um, when I started out. And that grew from, you know, just tutoring students to opening another office in Manhattan and hiring and training of like half a dozen people. Um, and designing curriculum, both for like more of the test prep heavy side, but also just for more of like the tutoring on different subjects. Um, you know, I think at some point I had, I was responsible for like 30 students. I forget if it was 25 or 35, but somewhere in that ballpark, they all have, you know, collectively 70 parents. Um, a lot of it is, you know, not just teaching their kids, but a lot of it is the consultative work of what should they sign up for. So there's a sales element. It was very much like kind of uh, the, the classic, like wearing many hats. So even though it wasn't, you know, what we think about as a tech startup, that business probably grew faster than most VC backed startups. <laughs> and the margins were pretty good too. <laughs> so in some ways it was like a really interesting view into that. Um, and you get immediate feedback. They, they take their test and they did yeah. well, you know, there was hopefully improvement. <laughs> yes. First of all, like immediate feedback on whether they're going to buy <laughs> you could the closest sale, like in the meeting or not. Um, immediate feedback on like how the kids are doing. I had built out, this was like pre Airtable, pre Zapier being mainstream. So I had built out this like monstrous Excel sheet with like all these concatenated columns where I had like the kids scores for different sections and areas of feedback to like help me like draft these emails. Cause I would email the parents every week about their kids. Mm -hmm. This wasn't like on top of just like full-time course load. Um, so I had like built all these little systems in place to like automate the stuff, get it done faster. Like it was, it's very interesting. Um, again, it wasn't like super high tech in any way, shape or form, uh, but it was still like, like high intensity, definitely in some ways from a business perspective, high growth. Um, it just gave me exposure to a lot of different like areas of a business that um, I think in a more structured role, you wouldn't necessarily have. Now the, the career in venture capital, I think it's more commonly known now. I mean, certainly when I was in college, it was not a thing. Like you didn't know there was no awareness. But like, how did you learn about, you know, internships? Like talk about, I guess, you know, like, you know, how you ended up in venture at, you know, while it's still at Stern. Yeah, it wasn't really a thing even when I was in college. Um, I mean, there's a club on campus now called SVS, the Strategic Venture Society. And I think someone started that when I was a senior. So again, I was sort of on like the, I was basically out the door when a lot of that activity started to pick up steam at NYU and at Stern. So it was you know, I was talking to a friend who was at the club I mentioned, undergrad Stern Women in Business, um, and she had just gone abroad to Prague, and I was planning on going to Prague, and I was talking to her and picking her brain, and like, what dorm were you in, and what's your favorite coffee shop, and did you like intern there, did you do anything when you were there, because again, I was just always working, and I can't really sit still, um, and she knew that I was interested in technology and you know if I had to pick between banking and consulting I was skewing more toward consulting she was like you know what you might actually be interested in venture capital if you're into tech and you know the work is not that different from consulting when it comes to some of the initial research and learning about different markets and industries um, and it's really hard to get a venture capital internship in the U.S. like those roles don't really exist they're hard to come by it's super uh, opaque so there's this firm in Prague that like you know if you're interested in that like maybe you know maybe they would hire you she connected me there. I interviewed with them. It was the first time I had heard about venture capital. This is maybe my sophomore year. Um, and then for some reason they hired me and I started working with them and that was sort of the beginning of it. And from then you sort of open up Pandora's box and there's like this world of opportunity that sort of emerges once you just have a tool built into it. 
which is something that I think is true even now. It's like, if you're trying to go to an event as an outsider where there are VCs there, you know, it's either like a $3,000 conference ticket or, you know, it's VC only because it's like a VC happy hour or it's like someone's annual meeting. But once you are, you know, an associate, an analyst at any fund, whether it's like an LPGP fund or a corporate venture fund or even accelerator, it's like the invitations are kind of endless, right? And that access sort of opens up. And that just became very clear to me very quickly. It was like, okay, once you're sort of like in the ecosystem, there are a lot of different pathways. And actually a fair amount of openness to like navigate within it and to meet people at other firms and other funds, et cetera. Um, and so then it basically just became a way of, you know, exploring those pathways, building some of those relationships um, and finding the additional opportunities that that would make sense for me. So how did you end up at Laconia then? So I was at the fund in Prague. Then I was at a fund in Sofia, which is where I was planning on spending my summer anyway. And I thought it would be fun to do more things in venture. And then I went back to New York. And at this point, I probably knew, you know, a couple dozen people at various funds across the European ecosystem. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I think I just have to kind of do that again <laughs> in New York. Because <laughs> at that point, too, the ecosystems were very different. Like there was like virtually no overlap between European early stage investors and, and US based, or at least New York based. And so I think I just went to like every event that I could possibly go to in the startup and VC world. Um, and some of these were just things I found on Eventbrite. Like I remember going to panels and, you know, having the event organizers be like, wait, you're a student? Like, okay, email me. We're going to reimburse your ticket. <laughs> like, what are you doing <laughs> here? <laughs> um, so people were like very open in that regard. And that's some great memories from that. And others were, you know, again, it's through sort of the network building. Um, and, I, you know, I ended up at an event that was hosted uh, by one of Laconia's LPs for uh, her birthday. Um, and I met one of the Laconia partners there. And that was just sort of like, I happened to go to this event. Jeff happened to be there. We met. And then afterwards, we reconnected because they were bringing someone on on a part time basis. Um, and so that that's how that happened. So it was really just, you know, continuously being out in the ecosystem, being really um not so much thoughtful as much as persistent <laughs> about like rebuilding a network from scratch um, and then just creating a lot of those opportunities uh, for that serendipity and for those connections to emerge. But that says a lot as far as ambition, right? That you went out there and you just went to events where you didn't know anybody, right? Like that. Oh, I did. I showed up to so many where I knew no one, like not yeah. a person. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. It's how you mm -hmm. build a network and then you get to know mm -hmm. people and then you go to another event and you're like, oh, I, I remember you from the last event. And then, and then you know some people. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then at some point, right, you start to get to know people and they reach out to you after they've seen you at three events and are like, hey, I'm actually hosting a dinner at my friend's apartment in two weeks. Like it'll be like 12 people. Do you want to come to that? And then you start to kind of deepen those relationships and, and then you start to get somewhere. Um, and I think that's just sort of a big hurdle for people to to overcome, right? It's like, you have to just start going to these things. And then ideally, and actually I didn't do this and I probably should have, um, but I think I was a little bit too introverted for it. Um, but if you can even start hosting things, even better, right? If you're not getting the invitations <laughs> or they're not like the right rooms, right? You're going to these things and you're like, this is not what I'm going for. Like just start hosting them um, and creating that ecosystem around you. Um, there are a couple of people in the New York market in particular that have done this so well over the last couple of years. Um, and so I would definitely recommend that for people who are trying to think like, how do I even get my foot in the door? You know, if you have that in you, I think it's a great strategy. All right. Along those lines, like, do you have any tips, you know, for people that are like, oh, networking and walking into a room where you don't know anyone, you know, it's uncomfortable. So do you have any tips on how to break the room apart and engage in those conversations? I think you have to find a way that feels organic and leverages your own interest and comfort level, right? I mean, nothing is ever going to be 100% comfortable when you're trying to break into an area where you don't have that exposure, but it doesn't necessarily have to be going to these events in person. If you know that you're specifically interested in fintech and you really want to get into the fintech space, whether it's on the investing side or on the operating side, you could start writing about it. You could start like interviewing people who are in the space. 
um, and creating content around that. Like you could do this in an entirely online virtual way if that's an environment that you feel more comfortable in. Um, so I think that's one thing, right? It's making sure that you are not like pressuring yourself to do something that is just not what you should be doing. Um, and then I think once you have sort of an initial like medium or strategy identified, I would think about ways that you can make it more palatable and make it seem less daunting. So you don't have to go to this event for the full four hours. You can just tell yourself, you're gonna go, you're gonna be there for one hour. You're gonna talk to five people. And once you talk to your five people, if you're having a terrible time, you can leave, <laughs> that's fine. So you can make that deal with yourself. I think it becomes much easier, right? And then even when it comes to things like social content, right? I think we make it into this really daunting thing of like, I have to publish the most interesting thing that's ever been written about FinTech and it has to be correct and insightful and it's an impossible task, right? So to the extent to which you can lower that barrier to entry for yourself and be like, okay, I'm not actually gonna publish anything new. What I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna find something and I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna read like three things. The thing that I find really interesting, I'm going to reshare with like five sentences <laughs> on what I thought was really interesting about it. And then I'm gonna like tag the author, right? And you do that. Or when they post it, I'm gonna reply to their thing. Um, and figuring out how to just create those like lower level engagement opportunities that help you flex that muscle while you build up um, both the habit and the comfort level with doing more. I think that's the right way to do this versus saying like, I have to do this really difficult thing out of the gate. That the, the five person goal is actually that's something that is like a something that I would do too. Like you just set a goal, so at least you achieve it. You feel good. The other hack that I have is show up at least fifteen minutes ahead of the event starting, because the room is going to be fairly empty and there's going to be people looking around to look to other talk to people, and you'll get into a circle of people. If you walk into the room fifteen minutes late those conversations are already with a nucleus of people and it's hard to break in and be like, Hey, I don't know anyone. I just want like, and you just, it's more daunting that way. Yeah. The second hack is, yeah. 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 The second hack is to meet the event organizers who are probably like the most interesting people there. Exactly. Yes. And then if it's a panel event at the very least, you'll meet the three to four panelists and you probably have to stand in the line to shake their hand, but have your, 30 second pitch. And then just like, do you mind if I email you? And they're going to say yes. <laughs> so then you send an email and then obviously you follow up and hopefully you have something, you know, relevant to, you know, follow up on. I so. really like that. And I think the key there is what you said, which is you make it 30 seconds. You don't want to corner someone at one of these things and give them your full pitch, which happens mm -hmm. to, at least to investors, that happens all the time, right? Because we're so right. excited and eager. They're it's like, a huge line. Shot. <laughs> yeah, but the reality is nobody can focus in that environment. Like, no. we just can't no. focus on what you're saying. We're looking at the line. We're already tired from the thing we just did. Um, so to your point, 30 seconds, get the contact information and use it as an opportunity to follow up after. I think that's the perfect formula for that sort of thing. And connect the dots. If you're going up to... to introduce yourself to one of the panelists, do your homework, look at their portfolio, investments they've made, make sure there's alignment with what they do. And you should have, hey, I see that you're interested in fintech and you're we have a mutual connection person in the fintech industry. I'm working on a fintech startup that I'd love to tell you more about. Obviously, here's not the place to do that. Do you mind if I email you? You'll, you'd meet yeah, me with me, right? That's the perfect script. Mm -hmm. No question. Whoever's listening to this should just like word for word fill in the blanks on that. Right. Yeah. I've done a few networking events in my past. No. And the hosting. I love that idea. That's a great one too, as far as like, hey, create your own content, host. And that's how these community people surface. They they start doing it. So all right. So so what is the background of Laconia? The firm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So Laconia was started around 2015. Um, so I joined not quite on day one, more like day two, and my two partners, Jeffrey Silverman and David Arcara, uh, they basically had just closed the first fund. And the inception story there is that the two of them had gotten to know each other through angel investing. They're both former entrepreneurs and operators, and they were doing a couple of deals together a quarter. They had sort of an extended larger group of um, friends and acquaintances who were also co-investing with them. And it was kind of, you know, deal by deal, syndicate style. And then 
you know, at a certain point they had done this enough times and had built enough trust around this group of people that it made sense to actually just institutionalize the fund and create, you know, a traditional GPLB structure around it um, and start doing it in a more uh, professionalized manner, right, with your fund administrator, with your back office, with, you know, all of the things. Um, and the goal there was really to take, you know, sort of the expert sharing and the expertise and the knowledge sharing that happens with angel investing and create the professionalism of a structured venture fund. So I joined them right after they had um, really started investing out of that fund. Um, and so the focus has always been early stage seed-ish. At the time when we initially started, it was more seed, what we were calling late seed, when it was really difficult for companies to raise Series A rounds. Um, you know, check sizes of a couple hundred thousand, um, really focused on B2B software companies that were mission critical and making existing markets and workflows more efficient. Um, so we've had a couple of, you know, iterations of that strategy over the years, still always consistent on B2B software. I would say the biggest shift has been around the stage focus, or at least what we refer to it as, as, you know, the market has gotten hotter and cooler over the years. Um, and I would say these days, you know, we're still sector agnostic within B2B software. We'll look at just about anything. Our core focus areas these days are largely around fintech, healthcare, e-commerce enablement and retail tech and vertical software. So just about any of our companies probably fits one of those buckets. Now seed rounds have changed a lot since 2017 ish. So, so what's the typical like seed round allocation these days? Yeah. So we are seeing almost like a barbell within seed itself. So they're either like early seed or pre seed rounds that are one to 2 million at sub 10 million valuation or they're, you know, like three to $5 million larger seed rounds in companies that are a little bit further along, but not quite at series A financial metrics. And those are like 15 to 20 in terms of valuation. Um, so that's, that's what we're seeing. You know, if you look at the data more broadly, what you'll see is round sizes have actually gone up. Valuations have gone up at free seed seed. Deal counts have gone down. The fewer deals are getting done and that capital is coalescing into, you know, into those fewer companies, which is driving up the key financial metrics. Um, you know, from our perspective, because we're managing relatively small funds, we can see a path to really good outcomes at a fund level of both those pre-seed rounds and then those more established seed rounds. And I will say what we are seeing is that those Series A milestones have been bumped up again. So that gap that we had, you know, in 2015 through 2017, before the market got frothy, that's definitely back now. And what we're hearing from a lot of our companies that are, you know, having some of those preliminary conversations or doing research around that Series A, we're kind of back to, you know, two to three million in ARR, three X year over year growth, strong unit economics, kind of all of the above for a strong competitive Series A. Um, and for a lot of companies that maybe raised a seed round in 2021 or 2022, um, you know, they've been operating on a different plan based on where they thought that that uh, goal was. Um, so there's definitely some readjustment that we're seeing in, in between that seed and Series A now. So how do you evaluate uh, and that, you know, before making an investment, how do you evaluate a company? Because if they are earlier stage, maybe even pre-revenue, like you talked about metrics for that Series A round, but for your case, it's you know a bigger risk. Yeah, I would say the most challenging thing that we're faced with now, whether it's pre-seed or seed, is what are the right milestones and the right goals for this company? Like what are the things that you're going to have to prove out, regardless of whether the next round is expected to be a Series A or you know a more softer seed round? Um, it's kind of, it's a difficult question to answer, you know, the way that we work with companies on that is the extent to which you can gather input from later stage investors and have ide some idea of what they're thinking that can be helpful with the caveat that they can always change their mind. <laughs> so any of that information, like not, you know, it's somewhat useful directionally, but it's not gospel. Um, and then really just thinking through like scenario analysis and optionality planning and looking at, okay, if this, then that. But if that doesn't work, then this, and you know, what are the additional capital sources that you might have access to, if not now later, some of that could be non-dilutive capital, um, or what are the things that you can do to either, you know, accelerate paths to revenue, um, or just, you know, prove out other things that demonstrate viability that'll give you a better shot at raising additional capital. 
Um, so that, I'll, I'll, you know, that's sort of the most challenging part of it is like figuring out kind of the right milestones. In terms of what we're looking at and how we're making those decisions, what we really are looking to understand at the early stage is what the founder sees in this opportunity. They are always going to know the business and the market best. If we know it better than them, something's wrong. So we're trying to understand what they understand. <laughs> and we're trying to get some signs of market demand validation. It's always going to be too early for product market fit when we're investing. Like they will never have it at the, at the point where we're getting involved. Um, but how do you know what you know? And in some cases, it's like super clear based on the founder background, right? It'll be, listen, this is what I did in my previous role. Here's the problem we had. Here's all the ways we tried to solve it. Here's all the technology we tried to use. Here's why none of it worked for our use case. <laughs> and now we went and talked to like 50 other people who are kind of in the same ballpark. And we found out these people have this problem. These people don't. These people tried this and here's why they don't like it. And that's how we figured out that this is the way to approach this. And these are the people who need this thing, right? So sometimes it's just the founder's own experience and expertise within a certain space provides confidence that they're onto something there. In other cases, you know, it's, we tried this and here's what we learned. And then we tried that and here's why that didn't work. And then we did this and then we did that. And now <laughs> having talked to 500 people, here's what we're seeing going well and why we think this is the right path. So those are sort of like two examples of like how that, that can work. An example that is, you know, gives us less confidence is someone who pitches, you know, SaaS product, then embedded fintech product, and then marketplace. And we're like, why? How do you know? And they're like, well, it's just logical that if they needed this, then over time, they're going to want to use our debit card. And we're like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that that's logical. <laughs> or even if it is logical, that doesn't make it true. Um, so hopefully that's just, illust you know, it's always so case specific, but hopefully that illustrates a little bit of, you know, how that early market demand can appear at the early stages um, and how it can be articulated effectively in those conversations. And, and what, from, from what I gathered, like your, like your due diligence process is a little bit unique compared to other VC firms, correct? I always hesitate to say that anything that we do is unique because <laughs> everyone Fair. says everything they do is unique. Um, but I can share a little bit Wait, more context. <laughs> Um, so we, you know, a, like everyone talks about being founder focused at early stage, right? It's all about the founder. It's all about the founder. Okay. But what does that mean for us? What it means is that we are really focused on how the founder articulates their understanding of the market and the customer and the operating levers of the business. Right. Do you understand what you're testing? Do you understand what the inputs are and what the outputs are? Do you understand how to structure your organization and who to hire when? So when we say it's a really strong founder, we don't mean they went to really great schools and worked at marquee companies. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Um, what we really mean is, do they demonstrate a level of expertise and operational competence that gives Comfort. So that that you discover through repeated conversations with founders, right? And in some cases, you know, it takes three meetings to get to a deep level of understanding. In some cases, if there's a steeper learning curve for us in terms of the industry or the sector, it takes five or six. But it's a lot of time spent with the founders and walking through sort of the core elements of the business. The other piece of our due diligence process is focused on making prospective customer introductions. So we don't. And this like was the part that I thought was super unique. Like yeah. maybe other firms do this, okay. but I thought this this seemed. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We do find it to be very effective, um, because what we we don't like to call startup customers right out of the gate, particularly early in our diligence process, because if they have any customers, they're very valuable. <laughs> they're the early believers. You don't want to bother these people. So it always kind of you know, rubs us the wrong way when investors like, oh, I had a meeting with the founder. My next step is to like call all their customers. <laughs> They're like, can you not, like, we can't have everyone do that. <laughs> that doesn't scale well for the guy on the receiving end of that call. Um, so what we do is we'll say, okay, give us a sense of, 
what your ideal customer profile is or who you think it'll it, it'll be. You know, do you have a list of firms or types of firms? Ideally, like the title of the person. In some cases, they even have the actual decision maker. They're like, great, here's our top 10 prospects. We need to talk to Sally, Jim, right? They have like the LinkedIn profiles of the specific people. Um, and then what we can do with that is we can go out to our network and reach out to some of these people um, and say, hey, we're meeting with an interesting company, you know, would love 30 minutes of your time to get your, your feedback and, and your thoughts on what they're building. And it allows us to do a couple of things. The first thing it allows us to do is understand if they understand their customer, because that goes one of two ways. It's either, oh, this is really interesting. We were just talking about this in our operating meeting last week, or it's, this isn't what I do. <laughs> like you should really be talking to this other person on this other team. So that's the first thing. It's like, okay, is, is that perception of the customer directionally correct? The second thing is, does the value prop resonate and is this a high priority and a big pain point, right? So sometimes you hear, yeah, you know, it's interesting. We're using this other tool internally. You know, nobody loves it, but it's fine. We're probably never going to rip it out. Like it's just, it is what it is. In other cases you hear, you know, this would save us 80 hours a week across our entire team. That would be really valuable. And yes, we've been trying to solve this problem for years. Okay, interesting. Um, and sometimes you hear, yeah, we've seen 30 of these, you know, there's a lot of people working on it. Other times you hear, this is the holy grail. We're not sure it's technically possible, but if it is, we would buy it. And so it, it tells us where to dig in more, right? Sometimes the feedback is really um, contradictory. So it doesn't necessarily give you like a clear answer or an investment decision, but it points you in the direction of where you should spend a little bit more time digging. Well, I, so... One of the things that I, you know, was reading through some of your um, your content on the Laconia website, and there was uh, a lot in there about, you know, first time fundraising for entrepreneurs, and you know, the decision to raise. Like, I think a lot of entrepreneurs think it's a, you know, it's a validation if you raise capital, but you don't always need to, right? Like, like it's it's not always a fit for your business. So, like, how do they? As a, how does an entrepreneur decide whether that's the path to go down or not? It's a really good question. And I think there's sort of, there's two steps to it. Like the first part is, should you raise money at all? And the way that I think about this is you should really only raise if capital is the gating factor to growth. If you're raising money because you need to test this or figure out that or experience experiment, it's a really tough sell. Um, if you're raising money because you found channels that work and you want to put more money into them to get more output, right? And you know that if you put money in, more will come out, great reason to raise. Um, in some cases, it's not even relative to growth, but there's just an upfront capital requirement that is needed, right? Like, hey, it's just, this is going to take two years and $4 million of just tech investment capital to build this product. We see this a lot in enterprise software and regulated industries. Like, unless you have a SOC 2 compliant product with whatever it is, if you're selling into financial institutions and it's only an enterprise sell, right? There's no mid market or SMB version of this that makes sense, at least not at this stage, then that's sort of like the cost of entry. Fine. Like, that makes sense, right? If you need the capital to get off the ground. Um, but I think that's a hard, it's a high bar, right? And there's often alternative pathways that don't require you to raise capital that will probably be easier, even though it doesn't feel that way. And frankly, will probably strategically be better for the business long term. So that's the first thing, like, should you raise, should you not? Assuming the answer is you should raise, right, for all good reason. Then the question is, who do you raise from? Like, should you be raising from VCs? And let's assume, just to simplify this, that, okay, raising equity capital from some sort of investor, right? We're not talking about grants, non dilutive capital, revenue-based financing, all those things, right? Because that's like a separate category and usually the right answer too. Um, but let's assume you have to raise equity capital. There is a world of difference between a round and, frankly, a company that would be a great angel investment and one that would be a great venture capital fund investment. 
And I think particularly at the early stages, that gets conflated a lot. And it's like, well, if I could raise 500K from angels, then it's like, then I should raise 2 million from, from VCs. And the reason those things are so different is because the return expectations and the growth trajectory and the timeline for a VC fund is fairly fixed. Now there's some variability within that because the expectations for a $15 million fund and a $2 billion fund are vastly different. But even at like a relatively low fund size, relatively small capital base, there is still this notion of the return the fund analysis where every VC is doing the math and saying, listen, if I put 500K in for 5%, 10%, 20%, whatever it is, like you got to sell this business for at least 600 million <laughs> for me to return my fund, right. which is so different, right? Knowing that something like 70 or 80% of all outcomes are M&A outcomes below $200 million. And knowing that a $200 million outcome, I mean, any of us would have to frankly be a little bit mentally unstable to claim that that's not a good outcome. Like a lot of companies would box themselves out of that as a viable alternative or a viable outcome if they go down that venture path too early. So we have a lot of conversations where, you know, it's a message that's not always very well received, even though we really do mean it well and in a complimentary way where we're like, you should just raise from angels and live your life and grow this business to $10 million and then sell it for 50 and continue living your life and then start another one. It's a great again. outcome. Great <laughs> outcome. It's great. It's great. <laughs> if I had that idea, I would do it tomorrow. Like, <laughs> if I knew I would only sell a business for $50 million off of right. like half a million of angel funding, I would take that deal. So, you know, well, once again, you decide that VC is derogatory, but yeah, it's no, it's good advice. advice. Yeah. But once yeah. you decide, okay, VC is the the path I want to go down. Like, what's the, what is what advice would you have on running a process from the entrepreneurial lens? And mm-hmm. I'm sure you see things that entrepreneurs, you know, probably shouldn't do. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's some ways that it is like a sales process, and there are some ways that it's really not enterprise sales. The way that it is like sales is that you have a funnel, right? And you have leads, you have first meetings, second meetings, you got to get to a close, right? You go from like initial meeting to close and there's certain conversion rates there. Um, What's really tricky about it is that there is really, in most cases, there is no inherent demand for the thing you are selling, which is equity in your company, right? Like if you are selling ice cream, there's a market of people out there who want to buy ice cream. You know that that is true. (laughs) There's no universe of people out there looking for exactly what you're selling. You have to generate the demand in a way that, you know, it's not just finding the demand, it's creating it. So the best thing that you can do in that case, right? Aside from, you know, a lot of research, finding people who are aligned, you know, figuring out what that that list is. it's just not running out of leads. And it sounds so simple, but the way to kill any fundraising process is to just run out of people to pitch before you have a term sheet signed. Um, and I think founders often underestimate like what that top of funnel really has to look like. Like before you kick off a process with seed funds right now, it's 2024, you should probably have a list of 80 to 100 people who are qualified, right? We're not talking if you're doing B2B software and this is like a climate infrastructure fund at Series B, like 80 to 100 people who are like in the ballpark of your investment stage and sector. And then you need a path to them. So this is like either 80 or 100 people who you already know or who you're like one degree of separation away, you have a mutual connection who you know can reach out on your behalf, right? Or they are good at actually reviewing their cold inbound, right? And you have high confidence that they'll actually look at it and take it seriously, Um, which we do. Not everyone does. It's tricky. Make sure you have like 80 to 100 people and then make sure that you can actually like run sort of a tight process where you're doing all of this in parallel. Because the only thing that will make VCs move faster is A, they either have a lot of capital that they urgently need to deploy because they need to raise their next fund. That's out of your control. Or B, they're getting really nervous that someone else is going to take the allocation that they might want. Mm -hmm. That will get them to move faster. You're Um, missing out. Yes, but it has to be real. It can't be 
hey, Jerry, you know, it's February 28th. We're closing around on March 3rd. Let's jump on a call tomorrow so you can tell me if you're in or out. That will never work. Mm -hmm. But what will work is we have a first call sometime next week. And they tell me, we just kicked off our process. You know, we've talked to a couple dozen funds this week. We're hoping to have, you know, a, a lead in a term sheet finalized within the next three to four weeks. All right. Then the next week, it's all right. We've had partner meetings. What do you need? We're in diligence with a dozen funds. <laughs> what do you need to decide whether you want to go into diligence or not? Here's the follow up to the questions you asked in our last call. Then you have the partners meeting and they're like, all right, we've had seven partners meetings. <laughs> We're expecting to get a term sheet within the next week. You know, we have, you know, we don't have commitments yet, but we have strong interest from at least three to four funds. Like, where's your head at? What do you need? But all of that has to be true for this to work. Right. May, yeah. Don't make stuff up because that's yeah, going to backfire. Can't make stuff up. It backfires. I mean, first of all, investors, if you're bluffing, most of the time we can tell. And if you're straight up misrepresenting things, investors will often find out because like, it's just, it's not that big of a universe. Um, and so we've had situations like this where a founder's like, oh yeah, I have a, you know, I have a term sheet from someone. And then, you know, we kind of piece together who it is or they tell us who it is. And then we bump into them at an event later that day. And we're like, oh, hey, we're looking at the same thing. And they're like, we haven't given them a term sheet. Like, hmm. That's weird. Yeah, like, hmm weird and the founder's like well it's like a verbal term sheet and we're like that's not a thing <laughs> so it's kind of worms don't do it don't do it just you, i know it, it's like easier said than done but have enough leads so you actually have enough in play and you know the frustrating thing about this is like oh my god how do i get 80 investors to like you know answer my email or answer someone else's email about me and that's the part that I think also like people underestimate, like it's easier if you're already within that ecosystem and maybe this is your second time raising capital, or maybe you were at a VC backed startup as the first or second employee. So you have met a bunch of these investors or you went to grad school with them or whatever it is. In that case, that's a more sort of palatable task. If that's not your situation, like the reality is you have to spend six to nine months doing that first, like building that pipeline first, putting that in place first before you go talk to anyone for money. Because if you start doing it like bit by bit, like, oh, I met three people at an event last week, I'm going to pitch them. And then next week I met three. You can't only have three conversations in play at the same time. It's, it's brutal. It'll take forever. Great, great feedback. All right. So Laconia, like you have a internship and a fellowship program that the fellowship program is, is kicking off soon. So what, what are the details of those initiatives? Yeah, we've had um, an internship program for a very long time. I was one of the initial interns back in the day. Um, so it's something that we've invested a lot of time and effort into. And we actually uh, spun the fellowship program out of it based on one of the frustrations we were having, which is we would get hundreds of incredible applications and only be able to hire two or three people at a time through this paid internship program where you know, these people were doing all sorts of investment work, back office work. They were writing investment memos, um, you know, helping us manage our CRM and our files and all that. They were doing a little bit of everything. Um, but we just realized there was like so much potential in this pool of people who were eager to help and eager to get involved, especially when founders always need help with stuff. And so what we did is we took a step back and we said, okay, what if we take the work element out of this and create effectively just an education and a training program that will give hundreds of people at a time access into how a venture fund actually operates. So as we talked about earlier, you know, it's the kind of thing where once you sort of have a perspective into it, you have so much access, but it's very hard to actually get that first foot in the door. So we've created like these cohort based classes. They're almost like boot camps, specifically on how we invest at Laconia. And they're not meant to be prescriptive. It's not here's how to make money in venture. It's not here's how to do seed investing. It's Here's everything we know about seed investing, and here's how we source companies, and here's how we do diligence, and here's how we think about term sheet negotiations and pro forma cap tables and portfolio support, and here's how we run our firm, here's how we do fundraising and investor relations, and here's all the vendors we use for back office. Uh, spoiler alert, way more accountants than you think. Like, whatever number you're thinking, twice as many accountants. Um, and then 
we create other opportunities that have shared value. So if someone comes across a company that is a fit for our investment strategy, we'll have them shadow the entire investment process so they get to see what that looks like. You know, same thing as if they were an intern or on our investment team full time. And then if we actually end up investing, we'll give them carry in the fund. Um, we also have project-based work uh, that can be available to people. So we do sector deep dives, which are basically like sector thesis projects. We'll have a fellow lead one of those. They'll partner with someone on our investment team on it and sort of like an advisory role. Um, and we'll pay people for that work through like a stipend basis. So the way we think about it is like, we're gonna give you the information. We're gonna give you the community. We now have over 850 people who've gone through the program. Um, and then you can use it however it's helpful to you. Um, and some people start funds, some people join funds. Some people call me and say, I'm so glad I did this because I found out I really don't want to do venture capital at all. <laughs> like, great, so saved you eight months of recruiting. <laughs> um, and we, you know, we try to make it both accessible and curated um, and really shared in, in the value that it creates um, versus some programs that, you know, they're kind of one-sided and they tend to leverage the eagerness of breaking into the industry. Um, we just always want people to feel like there's at least an equal exchange here. Um, and ideally that they're getting more out of it than they're putting into it. Congratulations on your recognition from Forbes for the 30 under 30 uh, investor you. recognition, which is awesome. So uh, th this kind of goes back to re rewinding what I was talking about at the beginning of our conversation. You've had this journey from as an intern in college to joining Laconia to now, you know, working your way through the ranks to being a managing partner at the firm. So uh, a lot of investors might do it for a couple of years and, you know, go off and, and, you know, start a company or become an operator somewhere and, you know, look at a portfolio company or something. What was it for your decision to, you know, stay within venture? For me, it was. Hmm. First and foremost, I think the team matters so much. Um, and I never had a reason to leave. That sounds really simple, but I think a lot of people will reach a point where they're like, I just have to get out of here. There's all these things that are great, I have to leave. I have never felt even an inkling of that. Like I've just been really lucky that our team is phenomenal and they're supportive and they're high integrity ethical people. And if I could work with them forever, I absolutely would, like full stop. So that's the first thing. It's like, I just got really lucky with that team. The second thing is that it was sort of a unique team structure and a unique opportunity in terms of the life cycle and the trajectory of the firm where the growth opportunity continued to exist and every year felt different. And I think at a lot of venture capital firms, there's like one or two good spots at every new firm where you have that opportunity. And then at a certain point, you kind of get top heavy, right? And you have like a handful of partners and the early people got promoted. And then it's like, well, what do we do with these other people? Like the structure of it is just such that unless you're raising funds very often or you're significantly increasing fund size, you know, with every new vehicle that you raise, there's just only so much growth opportunity. Um, and I think in my case, because I was the first person, right, hired onto the team, there was that opportunity to go from doing more of the junior level work, which is largely around sourcing, diligence, analysis, operation support, to the more senior stuff, which is, you know, portfolio company work and board positions and things like that over time to the more senior stuff, which is fundraising, representing the firm, being more external facing, um, being more involved in portfolio construction, fund management, asset allocation. Um, and so it's kind of been, you know, three or four different jobs, even though it's been directionally the same firm. And so I think like having that growth trajectory is really important. Having the team and values alignment is critical. Um, and I think just having you know, buy in on the team level of where everyone's going matters a lot. I definitely have had colleagues at other firms who have been just as good at what they do, who have had very different growth trajectories because that senior level buy in just wasn't wasn't there. Um, so I hope that's that's helpful. Obviously, there's always some yeah. things that are in your control and some that aren't. But those are mm -hmm. some of the things that I would be looking at in terms of um, what would make a role really interesting for the long term. Got it. Okay. Three apps you can't live without, and it can't be Gmail, Calendar, or Slack. 
Oh, I'm so glad that you didn't disqualify Zoom or Spotify because <laughs> those are probably my boring choices. Yep, um, those are good ones, though. And then we use a platform called Heartbeat to run the Venture Cooperative Program. It's sort of like Slack on steroids in the sense that it document management, communications, um, and really just kind of like core infrastructure for all of that. I am not kidding when I say that we would not be able to run the Venture Cooperative without it. Like it would just mm. cease to exist. <laughs> okay. Unless we found some sort of like close replacement. Um, so strongly recommend for anyone who's running either a community or cohort space classes or anything like that, that has a lot of moving pieces. Um, it easily saves me when we're running a program 20 to 30 hours a week. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I haven't heard of that one. That was a good one. All right. How about a good uh, podcast or book recommendation for entrepreneurs? Okay. This is a little bit outside the scope of startup books, but there's a book called On Writing Well by William Zinsser. And I strongly recommend it. Everybody could be a slightly better writer, myself included. So that's a big area of focus for me. That's a great one. Yeah, knowing how to write is very important. Absolutely. Uh, a thousand percent. Uh, okay. Outside of work, what do you like to do for fun? Are you ready for the most boring answer you've ever heard? Because I really, <laughs> I live such a simple life. <laughs> um, I, I really like just exploring cities on foot. Like I could just walk for hours. So on weekends, my husband and I are usually just on like a four hour leisurely trek through a new neighborhood or on like a very lazy hike that no hiker would call a hike. It's really just a walk through trees. Um, so I really enjoy that. Um, I've recently started uh, rediscovering my love for playing piano, which is something I did as a kid that I haven't done in a decade. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that you really do forget how to read music if you haven't done it in a long time. <laughs> That mm -hmm. is the muscle I'm reflexing. I'm, like, wow, I'm really counting the lines again. Um, <laughs> kind of nuts. Uh, but it's like super fun and just kind of meditative. Like you just are in a state of, you're not thinking about anything else. Um, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, and yeah, and I'm really just, I'm trying to do more things that just get me away from screens. Uh, the whole hybrid work environment thing is incredible in so many ways. But I cannot believe how much time we spend either in front of a computer or scrolling on a phone. So anything that gets me to, for lack of a better term, touch grass is great. Same. Yeah. I, I do the same. I, I try to like, I deleted, you know, apps off my phone where if I really, really need to get in, I have to like log in through a browser, which is a pain in the butt. So I don't, don't end up doing it type of thing if it's unnecessary. Right. Exactly. So uh, I agree. Exactly. So. All right, Jerry, well, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through your background story. Obviously, all the great advice for the journey into venture capital and entrepreneurial you know, spirit as far as raising capital and everything that comes with building a company. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. If anyone has follow-up questions, I'm easy to reach. Email is probably best. Uh, but this was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for having me, Keith.